Welcome to Unleashed, where MMA icon and power wrestling titan Dan the Beast Severn and Eric Carroll deliver a knockout punch of raw, unfiltered talk. Unleashed. Gear up. Gear up. It's Beast Mode. Not going to lie, it looks a little weird seeing the Beast on there, and he won't be able to be with us today. He's out doing some fan fest and other things, guys. But I have a very special show today. Uh, I got Miss Trisha Morrison. She was the wife of the Duke, Tommy Morrison. Trisha, how you doing? I'm doing good. You could call me the Beast if you want to today. <laughs> you can be the Beast today. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, tell me, how did you end up getting with uh, Tommy? Uh, well, it's a little bit of a story. I was actually in Vegas in 1996. I was handling a lot of tour companies into Vegas for tourism. And I was actually there the day that Tommy got kicked out of boxing, but I never actually met him. And then in 2009, I was in Wichita, Kansas, and I was working in a historic hotel and I was the sales and marketing director there, and I was handling all the VIPs and uh, and rooming lists and stuff like that. And I see this name, Tommy Morrison, on my rooming list. And with every VIP, I'd always Google to find out um, who they were, what their special needs were. Um, I had George Foreman stay at the hotel, Steve Forbes. So it wasn't unlikely for me just to look up uh, Tommy Morrison. And, and then I recognized the name and recognized the situation that he had been in since February 1996 and then pulled up all this media, um, all the horrible stuff about him. And that's, that's actually how we met uh, in Wichita, Kansas in 2009. And it went from there. So I'm curious, Tricia, when you looked that up and you saw these different articles and these different media outlets uh, talking about Tommy, what was going through your head at that time? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, you obviously believe what the media say because there's nobody in there contradicting anything. They're calling him a drug addict. You know, they're calling him evil. Uh, they're calling him uh, AIDS, HIV infected person and crime and DUIs and, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. There wasn't actually anything very good about Tommy in the media. So I, uh, you know, as a normal person who'd never really met Tommy in person, you tend to believe what the media always say. Yeah. Now, were you familiar with uh, Tommy before you met him and looked this up? Had you watched Rocky Five or seen anything about him? No. no, no, I'd never, ne never, no, never watched Rocky Five. Didn't even know who Tommy Gunn was. And I, I've done other podcasts as well on Rocky Five now and didn't even know who Sly was. So I was not one of those groupies, um, I guess you could call them, right? I wasn't after him for his fame and fortune. You've got to remember that when I met Tommy, he was no longer the uh, professional boxer that was in the in the news he was poor he uh, classified himself as homeless and he had no income coming in no fame no fortune that's the tommy that i met well you mentioned a little bit about his financial status and uh, you know that he was no longer in boxing what kind of shape was tommy in when you first met him when I first met him at the hotel, when he checked in there, uh, first of all, I was wondering whether to give him the best hotel in the room or the worst hotel in the room based on what the media wrote. It's like, oh, you know, who is this guy? Then I got to meet him. The shape that he was in, he was depressed. He was obviously had no money, very few friends. He didn't have a future to think about. As far as fitness goes, he really wasn't working out. He wasn't really eating. When depression hits, somebody like that who's literally had their whole life taken away from them in, in a moment, in, in a vapor, as he said, uh, they, they're different. They're, um, they're, they're just very different. When we met, 
he looked at me and I looked at him and he actually had a tear coming down his eye because I told him I wasn't the right person for him. You know, based on everything that I had seen in the media, there was no way we could have a relationship. You know, I wasn't covered in tattoos. I wasn't a stripper. I wasn't a hooker. Everything that was coming out in the media, I wasn't a drunk. And, and he looked at me and underneath his sunglasses, I could see this tear come down and he said, no, you know, you, you're exactly what I need. So he was extremely emotional. Now, did Tommy <clears throat> often like talk to you about like, you know, what life used to be like? I'm sure that had to be very hard going from here down to here. I, I can't imagine what that was like for the guy. Yeah, he he did. The years that I spent with Tommy, he was the most sober. We managed to do the drug rehab, get him off drugs. He didn't even drink. He he literally, Eric had one white Russian drink in the years that I knew him, and he, he didn't even finish that. He was more into milk. He was now more into uh, getting himself fit to uh, recover and getting his uh, esteem back up there. But it was very difficult for him. Every day he would uh, mention HIV. That was the household word, HIV. Why did this happen to me? Why, if I'm start, you know, if I feel so good, why did this happen to me? Uh, I'm supposed to be dead now. Gotcha. Um, it is just so sad to hear. How many of the people from like Tommy's past, friends and stuff like that? We're talking to him at that point in time. I know when you're on top and you're on all the covers, everybody's around. I'm just curious, like how many people were reaching out to Tommy at that point in time? Yeah, I could count them on one hand, Eric. Don't forget, though, that he was never able to pay for a cell phone bill, right? And in those days, there was no real social media like Instagram or Facebook to keep in contact with. And even if you did have that in those days, he wouldn't have been able to afford a laptop or, or, or a cell phone. So perhaps there were more friends out there that wanted to reach out to him during his darkest years, but lost contact with him because every time you couldn't afford to pay your cell phone bill, that's it. You lost that number, right? So I'm sure that there were probably more so-called friends out there, but quite honestly, uh, he didn't have many friends during his dark years. I would say that I personally know of four, four friends. That, that's so sad. Um, yeah. You know, what was, did Tommy beat himself up a lot over the past and different things that have went on? Uh, yeah, I think that you'll find that from 1996 onwards, that's when he turned to drugs and drink and DUIs. He basically gave up. You know, if he didn't even want to get involved in boxing anymore. He did have a few gigs where he was a commentator, but he honestly spoke to me about the commentating job and said, why would I want to commentate on a boxing match between, for example, Peter McNeely, right, and Mike Tyson when I couldn't be in the ring myself? And, he, and I know you just had Peter McNeely on. I just kind of Googled your you know, your site there. And every time he heard about that fight, he said, Tricia, I was supposed to be the one in the ring and not Peter. I think that was the dream fight for so long was Tommy versus Mike. And it was all people talked about for a very long yeah. time. Um, yeah, that's it right. Hard. It had to be hard on Tommy. I mean, that guy skyrocketed, especially after Rocky Five that amount of fame, that amount of pressure. I can't imagine what these guys are going through. Yeah, uh, yeah, there was a, definitely a lot of pressure on him then. But, of course, I didn't know him then, right? I didn't know what it was like for him, for fame and, and fortune. I just got to meet him when he was down and out and had no fame and fortune. And I, I basically I, I got to see the real Tommy then. And I want to talk some more about that. But bef before we get to that, let's talk about his record and just how impressive Tommy's record was. Yeah. And, and in fact, I, I always write it down because it's so impressive that I don't want to forget it. So his, he had an amateur record, a tough man contest record, and a professional boxing record. And his, 
his figures, his fights, 290 and 21 amateur fights with 263 knockouts. So that's what Tommy is saying he had as amateur. Then, uh, and that was from the age of seven years old, Eric. And he actually trained himself on, on his front porch with, with his dad. And then as of the age of 13 years old, right, he entered into tough man contests to help his family with financial needs. And he had 50 and one. He lost one tough man contest. And what's really funny, Eric, is that the one he lost to, when we were on Facebook together, that person did contact us. And before Tommy opened up that message, he looked at me and said, oh, my goodness, you know, I was only seven, you know, 15 when I fought that guy. And um, he's probably going to give me a hard time. But we opened up the message and they had a really good chat and it was nice for Tommy. But at the age of 13, he had tough man contests. Then he retired from tough man contests, right, at the age of 18. So that normally doesn't happen to anybody. In fact, it probably has never happened to anybody that you know of or I know of. And then he, at the age of 18, between the months of March and October, he won the Kansas City Golden Gloves. He won the Western Olympic Trials. He won the PAL Championship. And he lost a split decision to good old or good young Ray Mercer. And, um, and then he went into professional uh, fighting at the age of 19 and based on his record if box rec were to put all the fights that he had in it would be 51 3 and 1 with 44 knockouts right and of course he won two belts right this guy was amazing he definitely was and you know, it's that mm -hmm. Dan's not here with us because there's a lot of his career that intersects with Dan. Dan started off in the tough man competitions as well as, as well as Butterbean that I was talking to. That was usually the thing right. before you went to the pro leagues. And a lot of those guys did that just to provide for their families. You know, that was very yeah. common in those days. Yeah. I've spoken to Butterbean. Um, I saw Butterbean on a podcast with Hannibal. Right. And they were all joking and making fun of Tommy and how wild he was in those days. So that's when I approached Hannibal and I said, I want to be on your show because I want to show you the other side of Tommy. And Butterbean got to hear about it. And he messaged me on Facebook and he said, but I really thought Tommy was a great guy. <laughs> and I said, well, why didn't you say that right on the podcast? So. I mean, the sad thing is about it, we, we all have our past and we all have things that we probably yeah. wish that we could do over. Tommy was no different, but at the same time, he was a human being. And it seemed yeah. like there at the end, he was really trying to, you know, make up for some of those things. And uh, I'm glad to hear that in those last few years with you that he had some of those good years outside of yeah. the health problems. Um, one of the people that Tommy did have a relationship with, though, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about did he talk to you about his relationship that he had with Don King? Yeah, he did. Yeah, that was quite a conversation. And you will see more of that in the documentary that's coming out, that's being put together for Tommy. It's called, it's the official Tommy Morrison documentary. It's called I Am Tommy Morrison. But yeah, we, we did speak about Don King quite a bit. And I think that... What I want to say is that Tommy was actually pretty disappointed. And I've done a few interviews about Don King because in, in just my fight for Tommy in the last 10 years, I'm saying, Don King, where, where are you? Where were you? You know, why haven't you even approached me in the 10 years that I've been going through this uh, lawsuit to fight for Tommy and, and get justice for him? You know, where were you? during 1996 until Tommy died. So yeah, Don King was a, was a pretty big um, topic. In fact, in the lawsuit that I went into, which I don't know if we're gonna cover most of that or not, but I have Don King contract, right? That's one of the exhibits. And that was the contract that Tommy signed directly with Don King in 1995. 
And you'll see some interviews, old interviews that Tommy did about his uh, Don King uh, potential fight against Mike Tyson. That contract says it all. It is a three fight deal. So, um, yeah, three fight. Say so Tommy wins, then there's a rematch with Mike Tyson, and then there's a, a third fight. So it was over a $30 million contract. Mm. Yeah. That's crazy. <clears throat> so tell me about this documentary. Uh, what all are you planning on covering in it, and when can people expect it to come out? Well, to keep posted on the documentary, you should actually just go ahead and sign up to Tommy's official channel, uh, YouTube channel. So you've got three ways to do it. You can either go on Instagram, sign up for I am Tommy Morrison, which is the name of his documentary, or sign up for the Instagram account, which is Tommy underscore gun Morrison. So you can do those two, or you can sign up for official channel, Tommy Morrison, which is the YouTube channel, and it'll keep you posted there when it's coming out. Filming is still in place right now. It's in process. Got a great crew that are so energetic, have a huge heart for Tommy, and are doing their due diligence to make sure that everything is good in there and that Tommy has the best of the best. Tommy was an all-American boy. And he says so himself in some of his um, interviews that he did as a youngster. So he is an American apple pie uh, guy with with the flag flying. And I think people are really going to enjoy his documentary. And I think that it's supposed to come out next year, but I don't know what months yet. Got you. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the lawsuit? Why are you uh, bringing out the lawsuit and what is it all about? Yeah. Well, when Tommy died, he died on September 1, 2013. And when he died, they asked me if I wanted a postmortem. And I said, yes, I do. I said, because everybody's going to say that he died of AIDS. And what I'd like, and again, I am the widow, so I can request stuff. I was also the durable power of attorney in the hospital. And for Tommy, too, I said, please, let's do a postmortem. And if he had HIV, if he had AIDS, I want it on the death certificate. I want to be able to say, yes, you guys were right. But also, if he didn't, if you don't find the virus in him, and if you don't find AIDS in him, I want to know that, too. I want his postmortem pathology report. And so they they did my wishes and they did a postmortem. So September 1, Tommy dies. September 2, the media goes frenzy as expected because he was so-called diagnosed with HIV in Vegas in February 1996. And so, of course, you know, he would die of AIDS because that's the normal transition. But on September 17th, and that was 2013, just two weeks after Tommy died, I got the results and they found no HIV, no AIDS, and they did it in scientific terms. And the post-mortem is the gold standard. It is the final diagnosis of someone, and that should be taken as gospel. So I was happy. I was at peace. Tommy was right. And so I went to the Nevada Commission in Las Vegas. And I said, look, I've got Tommy's postmortem and he didn't die of HIV, didn't have AIDS. Uh, I'd like to know who diagnosed him with HIV on February 10th, 1996, that kicked him out of boxing, out of the sport of boxing, the sport that he loved and, and helped make popular, as Tommy would always say. So I didn't get any answers back from the commission. I then went to the lab, Eric, it's called Quest Labs now in Vegas. I asked them the same question. I said, you know, where is the lab report? Who diagnosed him? What test was given to diagnose Tommy with HIV that kicked him out? And I got no answer. 
So then I went to the physician who was still alive, Dr. Robert Boy in Vegas, and I asked the same question. I, you know, I said, I just want you to know that the postmortem says he has no HIV, he has no AIDS in his postmortem. And I said, you know, did you diagnose Tommy with HIV? Well, he came back through his attorney on uh, just two days before Christmas in 2013. And the attorney said, Dr. Robert Voy never diagnosed Tommy Morrison with HIV. And he did Tommy's physical and found him physical, physically and mentally fit to get a license to box for that fight. So I was like blown away. This is the physician that is licensed by or under the, the list of physicians that the Nevada Commission had. So I went, I flew to Vegas and I said, I need answers. And I went to attorneys in Vegas and I said, I, I want to file a case because I want to get answers from the commission. I want to get answers from the lab. I want to get answers from the test kit companies because somebody must have diagnosed Tommy with HIV because that is basically the scene of the crime in Vegas. So I fly there and Eric, no attorney, would represent me and Tommy. They said that they live in Vegas. They have to brush shoulders with the attorney general's office who are the ones that represent the Nevada Commission and that they, they wouldn't do it. So I had to go to, to the court and I filed directly with the court pro se, which means you're on your own, and I filed with the federal district court and that's how it began, Eric, and I did the circuit, let's say, just to cut everything in a nutshell because there are interviews out there that can hear the, the, the more details on it, but I did the circuit. I, I got everybody's... Um, admissions under oath, and nobody diagnosed Tommy with HIV in Vegas in 1996. Not the physician, not the lab, not even the commission diagnosed Tommy with HIV, and not even the test kit companies say that they diagnosed Tommy with HIV in 1996. Well, obviously, you might not have a definitive answer. That's what you're trying to find out, but why Why would they do something like this? It's just hard to wrap my head around why they would do this to Tommy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something that still, when you say a definitive answer, we're getting there. The, um, what I did find out was uh, after looking at another documentary on Tommy is a scene in that documentary where uh, Tony Holden, uh, is pretty much very much the ESPN 30 for 30 of, of my husband. He is the one that's telling Tommy that he had HIV. And I, I don't know if you're following a case out there, which I am right now, and it's called the Baby Reindeer case. Are you, Eric? Are you listening to that out there? Yep. Okay, right. So the Baby Reindeer case out there with Netflix apparently is showing a scene that never took place. And basically they're interviewing the real Martha lady, kind of like you're interviewing me, and they're saying, well, did that really happen in real life? And she's saying, no, certain parts of that uh, baby reindeer did not happen in real life. Well, I can come to you confidently, definitively, and tell you that there are certain scenes in that ESPN 30 for 30 that did not happen in real life. And one of the scenes, Eric, is the scene where Tony Holden is telling Tommy that he met Mark Ratner, who's a pretty big guy in Vegas. Mark Ratner, Mark Ratner is a UFC guy now. Um, he is telling Tommy that he met Mark Ratner at the ring, and there's a big scene on ESPN 30 for 30 shows the lights, a big scene at um, ring at MGM. And that is where Tony Holden gets his information that Tommy has HIV from Mark Ratner. Then Tony Holden comes back, tells Tommy, Tommy, you've got HIV. Well, in real life, Eric, 
that scene never happened as per Mark Ratner, right? And, and these are records that I have under oath penalty of perjury, okay? So I'm watching this very, very closely because when ESPN brought out that documentary on my husband, they should have done a due diligence themselves. They should have had a duty of care to find out, did that scene really happen? You know, who was the physician that diagnosed Tommy that told Mark Ratner that he had HIV, who told Tony Holden that, that Tommy had HIV? But none of that happened, right? So I think you'll find that in, in this documentary, Tommy's documentary, the official one, you'll find that there is a paper trail, right? Yeah, you know, and, and I've been friends with a lot of these guys that have movies come out and different stuff and the details are just completely opposite of from yeah. what actually happened. I'm still, I mean, I don't know if you can speak to this as to why they would do something like this. Well, uh, there's a Don King contract, right? It's a multi-million dollar contract and it's to fight Mike Tyson. Um, let's just say he just got out of jail, right? Okay. Tommy, Tommy was completely convinced in 1995, 1996, that he would beat Mike Tyson. So you've got the true science of no HIV, and then you've got the sweet science, right, of who, who did you want to win that fight. So with the fact that Don King didn't contact Tommy in all the years that, that Tommy wanted to fight again, the fact that uh, Don King didn't contact me when he found out that Tommy didn't have HIV, you would think, you know, if – if Don King signed a multi-million dollar contract with Tommy to have this fight that could have been one of the biggest fights of the century, as Bill Caton often said, that he would be really upset to find out that Tommy did not have HIV. Well, he didn't even show up in court, right? He didn't even return my phone calls, and he still hasn't to this day. That's interesting. Now it makes a little bit more sense to me because even when I was talking to Peter, you know, uh, just last week, actually, I was like, Peter, yeah. there was a lot of people that said that fight was set up. You know, you was picked. There was a rumor about this. He said it was no rumor. I was picked. They always <laughs> make the guy look good. And I was his first fight coming out of uh, prison. So, well, yeah, well, you see, that's why Tommy kept saying and that's really interesting that you mentioned that. Because Tommy always thought that that was a fixed fight, right? And But again, Tommy always said, I was supposed to be in that fight and not Peter McNeely. Oh. And now you've just mentioned that Peter McNeely actually acknowledges the fact that it, that it probably was, is really interesting. And, you know, as, as I dive into a lot of details and as the producer dives into a lot of the details, more and more is coming out of the woodwork. So it truly is a fantastic but sad story because Tommy really should be here today. Yeah. And so there was some other things I can't uh, remember specifically, but I know you had talked about like this 12 foot of gauze uh, that you yeah. had found out about with Tommy. Could you tell our viewers about that? Yeah, I will do. And, and again, what's really amazing is that if you were to go onto my Facebook page, there is another boxer, um, and he lit literally just in the last few days underwent something quite disastrous like Tommy, and his name is Francoise Boda, right? He's the, the white buffalo in uh, South Africa, and he's actually warning people out there, be very careful, be very careful of spiders, and the, he recently was bitten by a brown recluse, and that's Francoise in South Africa. The same thing happened to Tommy, right? Tommy was bitten by an, in, an insect, which the physician said was probably a brown recluse. And I'm going to just show you just a few of the pictures. First of all, here is the physician, Dr. Osio, really nice gentleman. And the first is the actual bite that Tommy had on the side of his chest. I don't know if you can see that with the glare. All right. 
then he underwent surgery and you'll see that this is the side of his chest and there's like a flat tongue that's showing into his chest here and what happened was that this inside his chest is actually gauze that had been left in there for his surgery once the gauze had come out that is his chest and you could literally put your whole hand in his chest there and i'm just going to do a quick reenactment for you eric because nowhere really in the media have they mentioned this they've only mentioned hiv aids but this was the beginning of tommy's downfall this and these are real photos um, that i took but this is tommy's chest for example Jesus. when we got out of hospital after tommy had his surgery he was just supposed to have um, a piece of gauze, a four by four a piece of gauze change and then put back on his chest. That's what the surgeon had ordered. And I don't know if you know this, but the surgery should have taken one hour in and out. We, could have, we should have been driving home after that, but we were in there for eight days. And when we got out of the hospital, Tommy was just a different, different man. And this is the reason why is when the home health lady came to change the wound, I noticed a piece of thread sticking out of Tommy's chest. It's a little teeny thread like a hair. And I said, there's still something in there. And she said, no, no, all I have to do is just change this. I said, no, there's something in there. So she then decided to pull on that piece of thread from his chest, right? And outcome. 12 foot of just tightly packed surgical gauze out of Tommy's chest. And it literally that wide, but as you can see, tightly packed, right? And the gauze came out covered in blood clots and it smelled really bad. It'd been in there for eight days, Eric. And this is what caused his downfall and Tommy died of septic shock, septicemia, because of an infection in his blood from this gauze and multi-organ failure. Oh, wow. This is what came out of his chest, you know, and, and a horrible, absolutely horrible situation. You know, people ask me, well, did you sue the surgeon? Well, yeah, while this was being pulled out, I was on the phone to the surgeon I said, you just left all that surgical gauze in there for eight days. And what he did was he apologized. He said, oh, I'm sorry. And so I filed with the Tennessee Medical Advisory Board and they lost the paperwork and I filed it again. And then they told me I was out of time, statute of limitations. So, but that's what the beginning of the downfall was that night. Tommy, on the way back to the bedroom, he, his right leg gave away, which was the side of, of the chest wound, and his head went straight through into a wall, the sheetrock, completely busted the sheetrock, and he fell to the ground, and he fell on the side of his neck. And we didn't find out for a few months later, but he actually paralyzed half his voice box which meant that, you know, whenever he could eat or, or drink, it went straight through into his lungs and he got aspiration pneumonia. So that was the beginning of his downfall. We were in um, hospitals for about 21 months, in and out of ICU, and, but he was doing really well and, and then he wasn't doing really well and he passed away September 1, 2013. Uh, a month after he'd had heart surgery as well. So it, it all began with a spider bite. Now, um, you know, it, horrible, horrible situation. Now, have you had much support from family and Tommy's friends uh, trying to help you with this? You know, you, when you go through something like this, as a widow and you keep somebody's death, uh, it's a death promise, a deathbed promise. I promised Tommy 
throughout all the time that we were together that I would help him find out what happened on February 10th, 1996. And literally when he died, I said to him, I will continue your fight, you know. But as far as support, huge support from Tommy's fans, who he really considered family. As far as some family members, no. You know, and I think you find that with a lot of um, deathbed promises. You have to be able to take criticism. You have to continue to fulfill somebody's death wish um, without any of that going on. But, yeah, it, it's always a tough situation when you try and fulfill a deathbed promise. Because when, when I was watching the 30 for 30, it you know, yeah. and I watched it again. They tried to kind of allude that, like, there was no credibility to a lot. Yeah. Of, right? So it's like yeah. they knew there was some digging into this, trying to find out what was really going on. It was kind of like we're going to discredit that before it even gets talked about. That was the impression that I got. Yes, absolutely, and it, and it continued for the next few years. I have, as, as everybody calls it, the receipts. I've got all the lab reports. As being the widow, being the wife, I'm allowed to have all the information from all the hospitals, all the test results, everything. So I have all the receipts to show Tommy had no HIV, had no AIDS, and quite honestly, people should be happy to know the facts, right? It's the people that actually claim that he had it that are upset to find out that you've got professional uh, virologists and microbiologists in the field of this virus that have scientifically proven that he did not have it. But yeah, you're right. They did try and discredit uh, me personally because for whatever reason, I guess because I'm the third wife, right? I remember when ESPN were bringing this out and a fan had called me and said, oh, are you going to be in that documentary? And I said, what documentary? And they said, well, they're bringing one out on your husband. I said, no, I, I know nothing about it. And I had to make some phone calls at ESPN and eventually got through to the producers. And I said, I'd really like to be in my husband's documentary because this would be perfect opportunity to let the world know that the scientists and the, the real pathologists have found that there was no HIV AIDS in there. And the response was, well, uh, you know, we're about to edit it now. We don't know if we've got room for you. <laughs> and I said, you haven't got room for me? And so they must have thought on it for about a week. They called me back. They said, okay, yeah, we can send um, the one of the producers down to interview you. And I said, great, great. So I was so excited to think that I'd be able to get Tommy's true story out there. And they flew down, a crew of about five. They, they came to where I was living. They moved all the furniture out, Eric, and they had me in front of the camera for three hours, right? And I went through every test result, every post-mortem, everything, right? Even the lawsuit, right? I even told them about the lawsuit. And they didn't mention any of that. And I know that they took shots of me. In fact, I'd had my hair up for to just to get ready for the interview. And like two minutes before, they said, oh, no, we want you to take your hair down. And I said, oh, okay. They said, yeah, it looks better if your hair's down. And I said, okay. And then I, and so I went and I put my hair down. And then I heard them say, yeah, she looks like all the others now. And I'm thinking, the others? You know, so I guess they wanted me just to look like, I don't know, the first and second wife, right? But it didn't, didn't stop there, Eric. You know, when that documentary ESPN 30 for 30 came out, yeah, there was a lot of hate speech, kind of like what that lady's going through for the reindeer, you know, the, the baby reindeer. I got a lot of hate speech, and it didn't finish there. You know, then I was told that I was a gold digger because I was in a lawsuit. No, I'm not a gold digger. You know, I met I met Tommy when he had nothing. You know, I, I don't want anything. And, in fact, the lawsuit was under the estate of Tommy Morrison, which would mean that it, if we won, and we didn't because it was kicked out because of statute of limitations, that – every single member of the estate would receive a lot of money 
it was a multi-million dollar lawsuit because of all the earnings that Tommy lost. So, you know, then you're accused of, well, he only married you because he couldn't marry anybody else. That was another thing, right, Eric, to discredit me. And then they said, well, you know, she just wanted him for her citizenship in the U.S. No, guys, I had my green card before I met Tommy. I could get my citizenship at any time. And, in fact, I still have my green card. I've never applied for citizenship. You know, and then they said that I sold Tommy's ashes right on ebay you know you can't get any nastier than that right and here i am just trying to say hey guys you know i've got the post-mortem i've got the anti-mortem you know tommy was right you know the pathologists are right that's all i'm trying to prove right to get the real story out for tommy and just kept getting attacked so you're, you're absolutely right when you spotted that on espn 30 for 30 um and i watched joe rogan once and he said that CNN did a number on him and it's called yellow journalism and basically you have one screen where you have like Trisha Morrison looking normal and then the other screen that the media would put out would be like Trisha Morrison looking green and ill and distorted and and, and hair everywhere well that's what ESPN were doing to me and just to try and discredit me. So you're right. You you did notice that correctly. Yeah. That's had to be hard to continue fighting for this. I know you, you made the deathbed promise and he was your husband, so you loved him. But it's 11 yeah. years of going through this. What What is it at the end of the day that you truly want to accomplish with this, Tricia? At the end of the day, actually, we have accomplished it. So the word is out there. Uh, there's people like you, Eric, that are interviewing me and other people that are continuing to interview me to get the story out. Fantastic film crew that are ready to get that out so that everybody in the world that wants to see it is able to see the true story of Tommy Morrison. So now people are not looking at me as if I'm the beast, right? <laughs> um, they're looking at me as somebody that's really just trying to portray the truth and fight for her husband and fulfill a deathbed promise. And I've done that. And I, I'm happy. I'm at peace. And people are realizing that. And they're realizing what a great guy Tommy Morrison really was and that perhaps they shouldn't have believed everything in the media. You know, I appreciate you so much for letting us know about all this. Uh, you know, on another note, one thing that has been in the media lately about Tommy is a comparison between him and another blonde hair boxer named <laughs> Paul. I'm curious what your thoughts on that is. Yeah, that was really interesting, Eric. So I get sent a link to an article and it's with Talk Sport. I think they're out of the UK. And I actually like that, that company. And they're quoting a guy called Faber, a UFC uh, Hall of Famer named Faber or Faber. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, Faber, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't even know who it is, right? And basically the article is saying that Faber is, is comparing Jake Paul to Tommy Morrison. And I'm going, what? You know, this is crazy. You know, you've got this YouTuber who I think, has he not just boxed one boxer, Tommy Fury, and lost to him? I mean, some would say Tommy, I mean, he's a boxer, but I wouldn't say he's like, you know, top echelon type of boxer, no. Yeah. So, so I got a hold of uh, World Boxing News out of the UK and I said, hey, you know, there's this article out there. Come on, you know, let, let's, let's see what this is all about and let's respond to it because there's no way that we can, we can say or have out there in the media that Jake Paul is like Tommy Morrison. You know, it's, it's a joke. So he, he put that out there, but also Facebook got bombarded and Instagram and X, you know, Twitter by all Tommy's fans. And it was so great to see Eric, you know, everybody's comments. In fact, some of them are printed in, in the WBN article, World Boxing News article. But here we've got one, I'll read one out to you. And um, Roy Hill, and they're coming from all over the world, right? Uh, Roy Hill says, no comparison whatsoever. Another guy called Bruce McHouston says, Tommy Morrison was a true professional 
who was at one time in the top five heavyweights in the world. I think it is great what Jake is doing, and he is obviously a money draw, but to compare him to Tommy is a joke and an insult to Tommy, right? And then we've got another one, Jill Demo says, our Tommy, because he's our Tommy, right, in this fight now with all the fans and everything, our Tommy would have knocked him out cold. I've seen Tommy fight. It's brutal. And then another one, Jason says, couldn't hold a candle to this man, right? So everybody is in Tommy's corner fighting against the fact that this guy, Faber Faber, is trying to compare Jake Paul to Tommy Morrison. And let's not forget, I think isn't Jake Paul's fight two minute rounds? Yeah, yeah. It's, right. it's nothing. You cannot compare the two of them one bit whatsoever. On the flip side, to see people still bringing up Tommy is good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was it was great when I saw that. You know, so sometimes you know bad publicity is is sometimes good. And in this case, it just brought out the fans. So when you said to me, when you asked me, you know, how many of Tommy's friends were with him during the dark years? At, and I mean, I can only name three or four. But for this to come out, right, and all the fans to jump into Tommy's corner is to, it was just fantastic, right? And you're right, keeping Tommy's name out there in, in an upcoming fight against an opponent that Tommy should have fought against Mike Tyson, right? Just brings up this story even more so, right? What's it like hearing from all the fans, their memories of Tommy? Uh, I love it. And, and, and the fans love being able to go to social media, to, to find me on social media, on all those platforms and tell me how they met Tommy, what they thought of Tommy, and how Tommy still influences their life to this day. It's really nice to hear. And I do post stuff out there on their comments. I ask them first, you know, is it okay if I share that? And, and I do. But Tommy, I remember when we were on Facebook for the first time in 2010, somebody had set up our Facebook account for us. And Tommy with his big fingers, right? Don't forget their boxing fingers, fingers that broke in nearly every fight. And he'd get on this little um, computer and, and, and he would pull up a comment and he'd look at me and he'd cry. He'd actually cry and say, I can't believe they still remember me. Oh, man. He used to love it. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, I know you've done everything you can to pr protect your husband's legacy. But what do you think Tommy would want to be remembered for? Uh, well, professionally for his left hook, right? And he, he used to get just so angry when uh, some of the media, like the Kansas City Star, would write up that it was his manager that trained him on that left hook. He immediately would turn around to me and go, Trisha, that's not true. I taught myself how to do that left hook. That is my trademark, right? So as far as the boxing goes, it's definitely his trademark left hook, apart from all his complete record, right? And I think in private life, I know, I know this for a fact, right? That when he did drug rehab, these are his results, and they're posted out there, and negative for, for meth, cocaine. This was huge for him, right, Eric? Yeah. You know, after 10 years, you know, I notice a lot of people go, "Well, he could have been, uh, he could have been a good boxer if he wasn't on drugs." And I'm going, get your timeline right, okay? He wasn't on all these heavy duty drugs during his career, and if he had been, how would he have passed the drug tests, right? right. So he took these drugs because of the worst years of his life, and he had nothing to live for. And it wasn't until we met, and I, I don't do drugs, that he realized that he could actually be drug free. So in his private life, he would want to be remembered for having completed, successfully completed drug rehab. And I know that for sure, that that's what he wanted. And 
recently, back in March, we did an amateur boxing event. It was the Tommy Morrison amateur boxing event here in Wichita, Kansas. And we had a lot of kids sign up for it. And WBO were fantastic. They gave us medals and uh, drug-free medals for the Tommy Morrison event. And I was able to hand out Tommy's um, results, drug-free results, with a WBO logo, right, and a certificate to show that they had participated in Tommy's amateur career. And I think that he would want every boxer out there to know that, yeah, you know, you can get really depressed and out, um, out of just life and society, but, you know, there, there still is hope and that if he could do it, anybody could do it. And I know that some people were touched by him and have become drug free. So that's what he would want to be remembered by too. Well, I have enjoyed so much talking uh, to you and, and I appreciate all the hard work you've done towards this one more time. I know you did it earlier, but tell everybody where they can keep up with you and find out news about the upcoming documentary. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter, X and Instagram, and it'll be a combination of Tommy Trisha Morrison or Trisha Tommy Morrison. But if you want to go ahead and log on to the official YouTube channel that we have, it's got a lot of little nice videos and stuff like that on there. And it is official channel Tommy Morrison. So it's real simple, official channel Tommy Morrison. Or Instagram, Tommy underscore gun Morrison. And then the official uh, documentary is I am... Tommy Morrison and you've got an Instagram there and you know you'll you'll see me um on interviews also fighting for Tommy Gunn right you know so not only in his professional life am I fighting to show people that hey he really was a good boxer he really needs to be in a boxing hall of fame but I'm also fighting after having watched Rocky Five for the first time four years after Tommy passed away I'm also fighting to say, hey, Sly, Rocky Five is not that bad, you know, and it actually is ahead of its time. And you've got Duke, which is really John King. You've got Tommy Gunn, which is really Tommy the Duke Morrison. There's so many comparisons uh, that it really is a real life story. So um, there's never a dull moment in my life, Eric. <laughs> I got you. Well, Trisha, thank you so much. And please keep us updated on that. When the documentary comes out, maybe we can have you back on. Yeah, we'd love to. Or we could get the producer on and then you can get firsthand knowledge from him. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Eric. Take care.